Today I've got a book for you, The Grand Design by Stephen Hawking. Now, The Grand Design is kind of a power-packed title, right? That's a very religious concept that um, religions use to talk about the design of the world, the creation of the world, and it's a play on words. He's using it on purpose because of what he's trying to accomplish in this book. Now, Stephen Hawking is brilliant. Of course he's brilliant. And of course, when it comes to his expertise, he absolutely knows what he's talking about. Um, C.S. Lewis had something to say about that. He said that we should listen to people when they're talking in their realm of expertise, and when they get outside their realm of expertise, then we don't need to listen to them anymore. And so I want to I want to begin with that because what Stephen Hawking has done is taken his brilliance and his scientific background, and he's applied it to things outside the scientific realm. Okay. There's a really great teaching company set, uh, great courses set, The Joy of Science, and um, I, 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 I think that that lecturer is probably not God-fearing either, but he makes a great case in the first lecture in that series, and he talks about how different um, disciplines can answer different types of questions, and science can answer scientific questions but it cannot answer religious questions. It cannot answer questions of faith because that is a different discipline. That's a different arena. It's, it's essentially a different aspect of the human reality and of the human psyche, and it cannot be answered and completely resolved, satisfactorily resolved, through sim simply through and exclusively through scientific questions. And he's absolutely right. Um, but, but, but the science religion debate, the struggle between those two, it goes back to the, to the beginnings of Western civilization. I mean, it's, it's always been there. It's what the story of Socrates is all about, which most people don't realize. And so what Stephen Hawking is doing here is not anything new. It's super important for you to understand that. The kind of debate that he's offering where he takes scientific discoveries and he applies them to religious questions was done in the time of Socrates, and it was one of the reasons why Socrates got into so much trouble, was because he was living in a very relativistic reality, and he, and he, was, he was bringing forward um, answers based on absolutes, and, and, um, and God, and creation, and natural laws. And his civilization was decaying as is ours, and that's a whole other discussion that we're not going to have right now. But I know you're reading this. I know people out there are reading The Grand Design. And I know they're going to college campuses. And I know that they're interacting with professors who do not believe in God and don't necessarily want to keep that to themselves. Um, everybody is kind of a missionary, <laughs> kind of a, an advocate for their own worldview. They believe they're right. They believe they know what they're talking about. And so they're going to try to convince people, just like I'm trying to convince you, that I know what I'm talking about. Um, and many people look at that and say, well, who are you? Why should I listen to you instead of T Stephen Hawking? Because he's absolutely brilliant. And what I'm saying is you should absolutely listen to Stephen Hawking in the realm of science. But when he wants to use his personal opinions and scientific discoveries to answer questions about natural law and principles and miracles and in the existence of God, why is he the authority? And why should you listen to him? And that's something very important to consider because he makes a brilliant argument. And of course he knows the whole first part of the book is giving you the history of science and pointing out key discoveries. And then he head on attacks, aggressively attacks the concept of natural law, the reality of absolutes and principles, and, um, and the existence of God. And... I did, had some great arguing that I did with him. All through my book, especially on some key pages that I'll show you, um, spent a long time thinking and debating, and um, there's all my red all around my pages as I'm arguing with Stephen Hawking, which is what you need to do. Do not take it 
for granted. Do not swallow it whole just because he's brilliant in the scientific realm. Think for yourself and consider things outside of what he's trying to tell you. Um, he wants to set forward a set of rules, and according to his rules, there can't be natural law and there can't be God. And those rules are that there's laws of nature and nothing ever happens outside the known laws of nature, and therefore there's not a God. Um, does he take into account um, the effects that happen through different realms of reality? Does he take into account um, the power of uh, the law of attraction? Does he take into account issues of faith and prayer and individuals seeing those kinds of miracles happen in their lives? No, he doesn't. Um, he says that exceptions to the known laws never happen. But what many God-fearing people say is, of course God's a God of order and he doesn't work outside the known laws. But why did that person heal quickly and this person died of precisely the same ail ailment. Why does there seem to be a force for good that's in encouraging us to change and be better? Why, um, why do we have a conscience, which is another post that I'll do for you. Why, is there, why do we have an idea in our minds about something that's right and wrong and make judgments on ourselves and judgments on others and no other creature on this planet does anything like that? All of those concepts are totally left out of his argument. He's taking it strictly from a scientific point of view and he wants to say, okay, everybody whose body is ever healed is healed strictly through certain laws and no other way. Okay. Yeah, there's a biology there, but all the stories aren't consistent in the ways that people are healed. Um, and what if we define miracles differently? What if we define natural law differently? And what if we look at aspects of human nature and notice that people are consistently um, gain results, have fruits in their lives based on certain common behaviors? What about that aspect of natural law and principles? Why is it that people have to save in order to get out of debt? And why does everybody that's wealthy say that? And how does that tie into, you know, this whole concept of, of God? And why, is there, why are there consistent things that we can do, laws that seem to govern our behavior? Why is it that we want people to trust us and that we want to trust them? And, and, and where do these value systems come from? And, there's so many other questions that should be asked when you're coming in. Why do people have spiritual experiences? Why do they exercise faith? Why do they believe that there's a God? Why are prayers answered? All these kinds of questions he does not address. It is strictly on the concept of there are laws. Miracles would have to be something that happened outside the laws. We don't see that happening, so there's no God. And, and the other thing that's really fascinating about what he's doing here is he's taking this whole argument so far to the extreme that he gets to the point where, and I'm going to quote him here, because I want, you to, I want you to know I'm not exaggerating what he's saying. I'm responding only to what he's, exactly, what he's actually saying. Recent experiments in neuroscience support the view that it is our physical brain following the known laws of science that determines our actions and not some agency that exists outside those laws. Um, it is hard to imagine how free will can operate if our behavior is determined by physical law, so it seems that we are no more than biological machines and that free will is just an illusion. And I ask the question, what is he not saying? What about all the other studies? Um... Science can't predict our behavior because we're too complex. To me, that seems like a lazy perspective. So anyway, he says, while conceding that human behavior is indeed determined by the laws of nature, it also seems reasonable to conclude that the outcome is determined in such a complicated way and with so many variables as to make it impossible to predict. For that for that one would need a knowledge of for that one would need a knowledge of the initial state of each of the thousand trillion trillion molecules of the human body to solve that. Uh, something like that number of equations that would take a few billion years, which would be a bit late to duck when the person when the person opposite aimed a blow. So what he's saying is 
It's all science. It's all predetermined. It's all destiny. You cannot, you do not have free will. You cannot control your behavior. You can't even control whether or not you hit someone. Um, you just have to watch out for their blow. And if we were smart enough and our computers were good enough, we could do the trillion, trillion equations that have to be done to determine what you're going to do next. We just can't do that math. And so then he goes on to say, um, so then he goes on to say, well, um, but for all practical purposes, the gravitational force between a person and the earth can be de described in terms of just a few numbers, such as the person's total mass, la di da di da So there's simple laws and there's more complex laws. The study of our will and of the behavior that arises from it is the science of psychology. Uh, that effective theory is only moderately successful, da da da, da. So, so then he goes on to say that some natural laws are easier to use to predict. They're cleaner, easier um, equations. But when it comes to human behavior, it's far too complex because the body is too complex and the brain is too complex. And we would have to do too many equations. And then he finishes off. Um, as we all know, decisions are often not rational or are based on a defective analysis of the consequences of the choice. That is why the world is in such a mess. So the last point I want to make about this book, he goes on to talk about his theory of everything and to give um, some synopses and some brilliant um, science and all that kind of stuff, but he spends the whole first section of the book systematically eating away at any paradigm that makes room for any absolutes in the realm of human behavior and any belief in God or any aspects of faith. And honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why he feels a compulsion to destroy faith before he teaches science. Uh, one of the things that Richard Hutchins said, which was so fantastic, was that his battle, um, the battle went, that went on between him and Dewey back in the day when Dewey was writing and he was writing, and it was the battle between the liberal arts and the kind of the modern educational system. He said, Dewey, he says, we, we the liberal artists and those that believe in absolutes and metaphysics still, believe that we can make room for faith and science, but Dewey says it's one or the other. It's either faith or science. And that's where we've gone to. That's why we can't talk about God in our schools anymore, and we are destroying systems of faith in order to teach science, and it's not necessary. There are many brilliant, really great scientists in the world who maintain a strong faith. Um, and the, the, the last point I want to make here is, um, is that you notice that he wants both outcomes. He wants to be able to say that we don't have free will and that we can't, everything is determined and that there's no such thing as God and miracles. And then he wants to make a judgment call about the world. He wants to be able to say that the world is a mess. Where does that value judgment come from? By what authority, by what part of his nature is he saying that anything is wrong with the world? If there is evolution, and we are getting better, and everything is predetermined, why is anything good or bad? Why is anything right or wrong? Everything is as it should be. Everything is right, everything is happening that should be happening. And if I hit you, or I murder someone, or I go to, you know, whatever it is that I do wrong, why is that wrong? It's aiding evolution and it's moving the race forward because I didn't have any choice in it anyway. That's, um, that's, that's, that's what he wants to be able to do. He wants to maintain good and bad and a value system without saying that there's even any natural laws, regardless of whether or not you're going to say that comes from a god. So um, anyway, it's, it's, um, it's a book that makes me um, really think and really kind of mad. And I, I want, if, especially if you've picked it up or if you're reading it or if you're thinking about it, the main point I want to make in this post is that I want you to turn your brain on. And I don't want you to just say, well, this is my paradigm and I already believe this and so he's just an idiot and you're gonna throw it away because people are believing it and people are buying into it. And um, it's very important that you think for yourself and that you go to um, other individuals and think with them. So Stephen Hawking, The Grand Design. I know I only focused on the beginning of it, but then of course, as far as the rest of the science is concerned, he's brilliant and and you can read about it and see what he has to say. But in order to talk about the theory of everything, and in order to talk about the grand design, 
and evolution and the Big Bang and all that, then he's, he's laying out a foundation of a worldview that he wants you to buy into. And remember, that's what it is. It's his worldview. So anyway, hope that was helpful. We'll post this um, on principles and on book reviews for you. And I hope that you will comment below. And I hope that you'll come over to the blog and comment there and tell us what you think. And we can open up a discussion and talk about all this great stuff that needs to be talked about. See you next time.